Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, a constructed response set on the private market pathways topic and the learning module on private special situations. Recall that we had a learning module on private equity. We had a learning module on private debt. And this one is a special situations on those two, although our focus here in this one is, uh, is on distressed debt. So let's get right to Meridian Capital a distressed debt investment firm looking at horizon hotels and resorts uh, they have some debt matures in nine months trades at 8.2 billion dollars uh, facing severe financial distress so the question then becomes can we buy this uh, 8.2 billion dollars worth of distressed debt and turn it into 9.2 billion or 10.2 billion or if we buy it will we turn it into 6.2 billion or 5.2 billion so this is really the essence of uh of finding i mean it sounds like a, you know kind of ironic or a misnomer undervalued distressed debt two potential scenarios and there are a couple of really good examples inside of the learning module here by the way um, if we compare them to other U.S. hotel chains, enterprise value of $12.5 billion in a default scenario, which has a 25% probability, uh, the value of those assets would be $4.5 billion. So we've got 75%, 25%. Don't worry about uh, how we came up with those probabilities. I'm pretty certain the Institute would give you those. Um, Meridian's current capital structure, $6 billion in senior debt, trading at a discount, $4 billion in junior debt, trading at a discount. So the face value of Meridian Capital, $10, $10 billion. Let's see, we've got some committee members who are saying, you know what, there are a bunch of different ways to do this. Comparable analysis, maybe we should use the discounted cash flow method. So there'll probably be a question that sounds something like, hey, which one is more appropriate here? What are the benefits? What are the costs? I mean, these are pretty standard kind of CFA questions. Let's see, 4% risk-free rate, credit default swaps are trading at 850 basis points, spreads at 750 basis points, and there's high trading volume. Ah, oh, that's good. Let's take a look at the four questions just quickly. So recommend whether Meridian should invest in the Horizons debt. So this is what I was saying about the undervalued distressed debt. Question two, let's compare these two methods. Which one sounds like it's better to evaluate uh, Horizon? Uh, is there capital structure arbitrage going on? And then how about a synthetic long position? instead of actually buying the bonds. Remember, we can go out and buy the bonds or we can create some kind of a, you know, I don't want to call it a fake. Don't ever tell your finance professors mm -hmm. I said it. But synthetic, that's kind of a cool word for fake, even though it's not really fake because it's real money being uh, being invested, but it's uh, it's financially engineered and that's why we use, uh, that's why we use the term synthetic. Remember that you know, this, this is good stuff, not just for this particular uh, essay, but for, you know, all the questions that you might guess. Why wouldn't you just go out and buy the bonds? Well, maybe they're thinly traded, which we were told they're not, right? And maybe there's big bid-ask spreads. Maybe there's uh, uh, adverse information out there. Maybe, maybe. There's all sorts of reasons why you might not want to actually buy or sell an asset, in this case, a bond. And so it's really cool that you can just kind of... Uh, synthetically reproduce it. All right, back to question one. So how do we decide whether we should invest in Horizons debt? Well, of course, what we need to do is make some kind of a value judgment. So it makes perfect sense here for us to use the uh, enterprise value in nine months, compare that to the value of the debt, compute some kind of rate of return, and then compare it against something else and the Institute is very big in this learning module to compare it to the risk-free rate. I'll, I'll have a, maybe I'll have a comment about that in just a second. All right, so a couple of steps here. Let's go ahead and go back to that 75%, 25%. So this is really just taking a weighted average of uh, 75 of the 12 and a half, 
25 of the four and a half. So that gets us what, 10 and a half billion for the enterprise value. Now, of course, the expected value of the debt depends on what is that recovery value. So once again, we've got to do the 75% and the 25%. So we've got a 75% chance of getting the full face value. That was 10 billion. And then the liquidation value or whatever you want to call it, you know, based on collateral or whatever is the secured asset, four and a half billion. So we'll just do the same weighted average there. So you get, uh, what do you get there? 8.625 billion. Let's go ahead and compute that. Uh, expected rate of return. The Institute calls it the implied return over that time period. And so this is just an F over P minus one. You've heard me use those terms, uh, future value over present value. We were given that 8.2. It was at the first slide, I think. So that gets us to 5.18%. Now remember, that's over a nine month period. So we need to adjust it. We did this way back in the very beginning of level one. So we'll just add one to it to reflect the compounding, of course, and then raise it to some kind of an annualized uh, figure. So 12 over nine, and that gets us 6.97. We compare that to the given risk-free rate of return of 4%. And so we say, yeah, sure, let's go ahead and make that investment. Um, if I were answering this question, I mean, this is what the Institute wants you to say, because there's clearly an example in the learning module like this. But I would add another sentence that says something like, hey, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to take some extra risk. We don't know how much extra risk here at this point. Maybe there's some other ways to compute that extra risk or a premium. And so there's probably a more granular way to make this determination. <clears throat> based on based on just credit risk kind of variables. But for now, we'll just go ahead and say, hey, you know, it's better than 4%. Let's go ahead and and make that investment. Let's compare the comparable analysis to the discounted cash flow. We put together two slides here for the advantages and kind of disadvantages. So comparable company analysis is probably really appropriate because there's other companies out there that are in the hotel business. It's very useful for estimating going concern terminal value. And from a computational standpoint, it's, it's less challenging. And you can use these observed market data. I mean, you can go out and look on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and so, hey, here's, here's Jim's hotel, here's Betty's hotel, here's so-and-so's hotel, and let's go ahead and make that comparison. On the other hand, if we uh, perform a discounted cash flow analysis, then we have to make a whole bunch of assumptions inside of the model, not least of which is let's just pick a time period. Now, I know we, we did the nine months there, but it could be 12 months, it could be 13 months, it could be two years. So we, we have to pick a time frame that's relevant. Uh, and then we've got to figure out all those cash flows that are going on in the future. And remember, we call them and this is not just the Institute, this is in every finance textbook out there. We call these uncertain cash flows. So whenever we make an estimation, whenever we make a prediction, we know we're going to do it with some degree of error. And, uh, you know, what is that degree of error? So the question then becomes, is it this much or is it this much? Um, but it's tough when you do discounted cash flow analysis because uh, you're going to be wrong you, and you need to know how, how far off you're going to be. And then, of course, what kind of a discount rate do you use? Do you use the risk-free rate of interest? Do you add some kind of a premium based on credit default swaps or based on credit spreads or based on, hey, you know, Jim's method of evaluating credit risk? Yeah, so look at that third bullet point there, you know, multiple assumptions. So there we go. We're going to go ahead and uh, use the comparable approach. More practical solution reduces complexity. And we go to the New York Stock Exchange to find, what did I say, Jim's Hotel and Betty's Hotel. Makes perfect sense. All right, what about uh, some kind of an arbitrage trade, Horizon's uh, senior and junior debt? Um, what we'll need to do is analyze those expected values. Let's go ahead and do that. Swinging back to the 75% and the 25% probability. 
uh, we'll go ahead and calculate that expected value. So six billion and four and a half billion, take the weighted average of those two, we get uh, 5.625. Current price is 5.7, so they're, they're about the same. So notice what we have there, a slight, a slight overvaluation. I'm guessing that if the Institute asked you this question on the exam, that the numbers will probably be substantially different. So maybe the current price, you know, is 7.1 billion. So you're off by one and a half billion. I mean, that's, that's pretty substantial. So you could make, uh, kind of make an obvious conclusion. Uh, the junior debt, we're going to take a weighted average of that as well. But of course, the junior debt, uh, we get nothing. So notice there's 25% of zero. So that gets you uh, 3 billion. Current price, 2.5 billion. So that is indicating, uh, that's indicating undervaluation. So what do we have over here? Slight overvaluation, slight or maybe more than slight undervaluation. Uh, notice that this is kind of cool. Giving, giving us an indication of the difference between the junior debt here and the senior debt back here, um, our, choice, our choices and other choices out there to value uh, these two different kinds of debt for the same company. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're going to do the same thing that we always do in some kind of an arbitrage situation. We're gonna go ahead and go long on the junior debt and short on the senior debt. There's the undervaluation and the overvaluation. And remember that this goes back to what we learned in the hedge fund universe, where we, uh, lots of hedge funds like to do those correlation trades where, you know, if two stocks have, let's just make a perfect example. If two stocks have a, if they're perfectly correlated, right? One to one, you know, so they go like this. They go like this all the time, but then all of a sudden that correlation falls to 0.6 or 0.7 or something. But, you know, there's mean reversion out there, you know, so they're going to come back to that. Uh, they're going to come back to their uh, to their mean. Well, this is the same thing here. Long on the junior debt, short on the senior debt. Now, I think this is the coolest question uh, of all of them. And there's also a good example inside of the learning module here. So how do you create a synthetic long bond position? So all you gotta do is think about what, what you get when uh, uh, when you buy a bond. So let's just suppose I, I'm Jim, Jim's construction company and I issue a bond. You guys are all my bond holders. Let's suppose it's a fixed rate bond and I promise to pay you um, $100 a year for 10 years. So what do you do? You get $100 every year for 10 years, then you get the $1,000 par value of the bonds. Well, how can you synthetically create that? Well, there are a bunch of different ways, but what's given in this problem is that there's some kind of a market reference rate that is a floating rate. So we're gonna deposit funds. So what this is gonna do is ensure that <clears throat> at the end of the period, we have the par value of the bond, <clears throat> whatever that number is, just suppose it's a thousand dollars. So we deposit some amount today, uh, let's suppose it's $947. And so over that time period, some years we get, or some time periods we get high interest, some time periods we get low interest, but we expect to have that $1,000. So that takes care of the principal amount. So how do we consider the uh, coupon payments that we would get had we owned the bond. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go into the credit default swap market and we're going to go ahead and sell this CDS protection, protection, which means that we're going to receive, we're going to receive the payments from whoever wants to uh, uh, transfer that credit risk. So think of what we've done in part one and part two. <clears throat> We're replicating the payoff of a $1,000 par value, and we're replicating the coupon payments according to 850 basis points. Now, one and two, that would take care of life if, if, and this is a big if, that market reference rate up at the top was a fixed rate, but it's not, it fluctuates. So we need to do a third part here to enter into an interest rate swap. So this is what I teach my students all the time. I'm hoping that you remember this from level one, two, and three, whenever we talked about swaps. When you have a position in the underlying asset, 
All you do is you pick up the phone and call the swap dealer and say, hey, I'm, I'm receiving a fixed payment or I'm receiving a floating payment. Can I send those to you? So in this case, we're receiving a floating payment. So what we want to do is pay the floating rate over to the swap dealer. We want to get rid of the floating rate and we want to receive the fixed rate. Pay the floating, receive the fixed. So now with this third leg of this synthetic bond, we now have replicated, we have synthetically created a fixed rate bond. We need the deposit, we need the CDS, and we need the interest rate swap. Boy, I love talking about uh, interest rate swaps. And so here's a little summary. Uh, there's the fixed rate return that I was telling you about, interest rate protection, and, and we're gonna have a higher yield um, given some of those inputs from the table uh, from a couple of slides ago. So that was fun right there. That takes us through the private special situation. So, hey, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.